I will try to be fast. I know that everybody promised you that, uh, but actually I have just like 20 slides, so it should be fast. So um, I will continue the line uh, that Ariel started, uh, but I will claim half of the things probably like the opposite. So let's see which room you believe more. So the agenda for today is a quick motivation introduction, biological and mathematical background, like really, really quickly, a pandemic spread and control models, a, some results on cool graph, because let's to be honest, we're all here for the graphs, and summary and take a home message, a, because we need one. Cool. So I will skip it a bit, because I try to claim a, that epidemiology is quite of like multidisciplinary, and we need a lot of knowledge from different aspects, but I think Ariel did a great job to explain in this part. So I will have more time for the equations, which is probably better. So let's start with the equation or the model that everybody knows and hates, the SIR one. So it actually assumes really simple dynamics. It assumes they have three types of uh, epidemiological or clinical states, people that can be infected, people that are currently infected, and people that recover from being infected. Uh, notice nobody died in my model, uh, which is great. We don't want people to die. Uh, yeah, but not really realistic. So a lot of equations, uh, you can ignore them. The only equation I want you to notice is, you know, mathematician, we need one, uh, is the, uh, the uh, bottom one on the right, which namely says that I have the same probability to meet each one of, them, of you at each point of time. This is not true. I have more probability to meet my wife uh, than your. Uh, so this uh, argument is false, but we will have it for a second. So as you can imagine, this model uh, is quite bad. And uh, Ariel actually said the same thing. The SR models are quite bad. But this is not the end of line. So we can improve them. And we have a lot of ways to do so. So for example, we can exp uh, add biological knowledge for like exposed state. We know that when a disease is a part, like you get infected, you're not infectious yet to others, and you start to be like developing the disease inside you for, for some period of time. Uh, we have vaccination. You're probably familiar with this idea. Social networks. So the second claim, it's untrue because of social networks. So you have your close friend, you have family, you have like team members or working uh, colleagues, etc and you don't meet everybody on the street on the same day, because nobody is in the same street every day. Uh, and movement. A lot of people ignoring one of the most interesting part of urban cities and, and like life in general, we are move a lot. So you have your car to go come here, you use the bus, you use the train, you're actually spending your time in one room of like in this building and another room. So all this movement is actually really chaotic and super interesting, and we should take it into consideration. So. Most of the, of the day, we spend a lot of time on saying deep learning is amazing and machine learning is amazing. I, I don't say this is not true. I use them all the day, all the time. But let's not forget the classical models. It seems like in the last like, few years, everybody decided that we, ah, we have machine learning, it solves everything. Uh, well, no. So I will try to claim that we can use actually a different aspect of, my, of like classical models and interrupt or in, in, uh, introduce into them machine learning components. But you need to do it really wisely, and I'll show it in a second. So if I continue the first point, you have two types of extensions. If you go on, on epidemiological model, you have the temporal ones, a properties changing over time, and you have the special ones, the properties changing over space. Uh, don't get the fright from the Latin, uh, that people like MDs in the, cloud, in the cloud, so I need to use a bit of Latin. Uh, just to give them feel at home. So all of this is really interesting, and a lot of people working on epidemiological models or control aspects of epidemiology, which are taken into consideration really, really important aspect. We all really love money, and we all don't have enough of it. No matter how much you have, you don't have enough. And this is true to people, so it's even worse when you speak about countries. So you just don't have five million pounds or five million billion pounds to handle a disease. So you have some constraints. You have two types of them. The first one is the one that you don't really have a, know how to control, which is how much your, your economy is damaged by the, influ or, uh, 
by the disease. For example, what you can see on the left is a uh, graph from the Israeli uh, Biro, Statistical Biro, showing the amount of predicted uh, unemployment rates in blue, uh, in red, excuse me, and blue is the ones that are actually measured due to COVID-19 pandemic in Israel. As you can see, a lot of unemployment. From the economics in the crowd, you can imagine for yourself that like, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of unemployment is a bad idea. So this is the damage to the economy, or part of the damage to the economy. The second span, the economical constraint, is the available resources you have to control the pandemic. So on the right, what you can see is the amount of, from the GDP, from the amount of how much money each person produced to the population, or contributes, if you want, to the population, you have the percentage the countries used in 2020 to handle the COVID-19 pandemic. Just to give you a perspective, Israel uses around 9.8, 9.7 percent of her, her GDP, it, the GDP, into a, the army. So around 10 percent. Okay, you can see here countries like Italy spending more than 40 percent of the GDP in the same year to handle the, the pandemic. For four times the amount that the IDF requires in a year in Israel, Italy spent her relative amount to controlling the pandemic. Think about how much money is it. Uh, so you have two of them. And, <coughs> yes. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so you want to see some machine learning, because this is like a conference about AI, and I need to provide. So for the machine learning aspect, most of the papers, and I've taken about 90%, if not more, actually trying to do something like that. You have some metric about the pandemic, yeah, like spread metric. For example, the amount of infected individuals, you have mortality rate, you have, a, you probably recall from the COVID R0, yeah, the basic reproduction number, everybody loves it. Uh, so you try to predict some amount of, some metric about the control of the infection spread. This is what most of people do. I try to claim this is actually a really bad idea. Uh, and the re main reason this is bad is because empirically, we are doing really bad work. J just check it out. We're really bad at predicting epidemiological stuff. But we are pretty good in predicting how control or in in intervention policies in their former name actually change in the course of the pandemic. So we should focus on the second one, and I will try to convey you with the following example. So in each mathematical uh, presentation, you need one slide with a lot of equation. This is basically to show that I'm smarter than you. Um, I give you 30 seconds to convey, but I'm, I'm joking. I'm probably not smarter than, than you, at least statistically. Um, so you have the following equation. I will skip the, all the explanations. The main idea is that we try to do some multi-strain. Multi-strain saying that I don't have one pandemic at a time. I have several pandemics of the same pathogen, but different like mutations. I don't get into the difference between the strain and mutation, just believe me. So for example, if you recall for COVID, we have at the peak for mutation, for active mutations. Do you recall? We have all the like uh, Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. We have other uh, mutations afterward, but they ones less popular. They don't get the same level of PR as the first ones. So we have a lot of mutations. And we actually modeled the SIR one that I started saying this is really actually a bad model. But if you take into consideration the exposed state, the hospitalization dynamics, you have dead people, which is in general a bad idea, but included in the model is actually a good idea uh, because people die from a disease. And you have a lot of complexity. You actually was able to capture the entire complexity of the epidemiological states of the population. In addition, uh, pandemics are not static. I think COVID is the best uh, idea to show that because you have a lot of the mutations. So we, in the model, we actually take into consideration the mutation process of the pandemic. So actually, when you're looking on classical pandemics like flu, so I'm not sure if you recall, but flu is actually an active pandemic according to the World Health Organization. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so it's actually an, an active pandemic which has peaks every winter. You don't treat it like one, but it's actually a pandemic. So the mutation is the one parameter, one dynamics is making it uh, keeping alive because it's actually mutating between one year and another, make it it's enough aggressive or which enough um, infection audience 
uh, to stay alive. So we took this dynamics into consideration, and of course, we need an, a pandemic intervention policy because I said to you that we need to learn one and be really, really good at it. So we, in a work, in this work, actually focused on a specific type. When you have a, a, con uh, a pandemic under control, your most vulnerable place is when a new mutation is occurring. Yeah, I think it makes sense, right? So we need to find it and we want to prevent it. So preventing a mutation is quite easy. You just get the mutation from patients, study its like genomes, etc., and develop a cure. When you have a one cure, developing a cure for a mutation is quite easy. Yeah, for all the biologists in the crowd, I'm really, really sorry for like making your work sound really easy. I know it's harder, but uh, for my purpose, it's really easy. So believe me for that. So our model, we do something like that. We will assume we can sample a subpopulation of the, a random subpopulation of the population. And from the sample, we have one of two things. One, we don't find any new strain. Yeah, it's one ha which is gonna happen most of the time. And the second option is that we find a new strain. And if we find it, we have some delay. The, so the delay is corresponding to the time we need to develop the new like vaccination, for example, and we have some reduction factor. So if you get vaccinated, you're not as exposed to the virus or the disease as before. So keep it in mind. And in last, we have an economy. So merging the two ideas I proposed before, we have one idea for the hospitalization cost. So if people get in sick, you need to treat them. Treating people cost money, so we need to take it into consideration. And when you sample the population, you have some, like, you need to spend money. You need tests, you need operations, you need other stuff. It can be summarized in those equations. And a cost at some point in time t looks like that. You can believe me. And the total cost is just the summary between all the points in time. Uh, so we have some uh, economy to, and damage to minimize. So uh, machine learning, we actually used an interesting approach. I think it's interesting. Uh, I don't have time? OK, cool. We used a really interesting approach. We used this agent-based simulation to simulate the data. And we used an, uh, deep, uh, deep learning to have an, a, run, a reinforcement learning model to learn the optimal control policy for the uh, detection of new strains. So we want to detect the new strains from the data. Uh, we have a lot of parameters. And I will skip the boring stuff and the cool stuff. So the baseline, as you can see, is the data for Israel, 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2020 2021. The red one is, as you can notice, are the waves that we had. Yeah, The first one you was in home, in the second one you was at home, in the third one you was at home. Basically, was it home below? The job was better in my house. Uh, so the blue one is when we uh, taken an optimal size of the population, so the, the agent learns the optimal size. The yellow one is the agent learned the optimal policy, so which to test and when. And the uh, green one is the optimal for both parameters. As you can see, we actually was able to show that if we perform a, assuming the subtraction, a, the model, we was able to save the economy and finish the pandemic in around one year time, a, more or less. As you can see, it's quite stochastic. Uh, another few ideas from the same point. So if you take the, all the comments that saying that we want to learn using machine learning the policy and you use any simulations to predict the pandemic dynamic, even if not really accurate, we actually can learn specific tasks which can be of interest. For example, we can learn a tourism policy, when to close and open borders. We can learn how uh, pathogens in uh, fields, the, the mosquified fields actually work. Right? So you want to seed your plants, and you want uh, the pandemic to spread between the plants of your field. You need to decide how far from each other you plant them. So another approach. And my favorite, uh, pandemics actually making uh, animals to extinct, which is really, really bad, because I really like animals. I think most of you, uh, at, at least the cute ones. And you don't want them to extinct, and you need to understand how it works. Uh, I will finish by thanking all my colleagues uh, for all the projects that I just shared with you are the joint works of a lot of good people. Uh, I have one slide for that, but there are actually much more. Uh, and to conclude, uh, epidemiology is hard. 
I, I think we convinced it in the last two presentations. And if you actually want to use machine learning for it, use it for policy design. Don't try to predict it. It just doesn't work. And finally, I really suggest to solve specific tasks. Don't try to say, I have a tool that try to solve everything for the government or the policymakers. I, see, I hear a lot of claims, especially from the industry, saying, yeah, we have a tool that's predicting everything, and everything it works, and they're really, really good. And then you actually test it, and it's garbage. So don't try to win all the awards at once. Try to win one specific war. It usually like, increases the, the chances you actually will be able to do so. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? How could you predict prospectively that uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> COVID, uh, COVID epidemic will uh, in evolve into less and less uh, um, severe strains? You could uh, only, uh, only knew about it uh, retrospectively. There was no way to know. Yeah, you're okay, absolutely okay. right. So, uh, and uh, the, the, some of your models uh, uh, would have not been uh, uh, would have not fit the this epidemic. So you're a absolutely right. B, it's not a problem because uh, the model is really really stochastic. So you're basically in practice what you do you simulate a lot of uh, cases, and when I say a lot, I like we simulated few millions cases. Each one is quite different, but if you average them. There actually some parameters, for example, the basic reproduction number, so how much each individual infects secondly individuals, is more or less stable. So even if you have a really like aggressive variation and you don't unlikely or un, un, like don't have a lot of fortune, so you still have a really good boundaries of what you do. So you don't need, for example, spend a, some others will tell you to spend exponentially a lot of money to handle the pandemic. This is just like the worst, 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 worst uh, case. And in practice, the chance you have this worst case, or the one you suggested, which the really aggressive mutations one time by another. Yeah, but this is fine. So it is like an easy case. If you actually, in computer science, you like to handle the worst case scenario. And if you handle the worst case scenario, you by nature get an all easier case. So you're suggesting an easy case. You infect a lot of people, but if they don't really seek and if they don't really die, you don't have any economical or sociological cost for it. So yes, yeah, they have like a bad day or two, but you don't have any influence either on the economy or on the society. So this case, you get it for free. If you handle the worst one, OK? So people get sick every now and day. This is exactly how we treat the flu, which is, by, again, by definition, a pandemic. Not really interesting one, though. Any other question? Don't be hard time. Okay. Thank you very much.